Hello, my name is Morgan Gray, and welcome back to the Afrocentric Podcast. Nobody act black and then go home and be white. I got two pistols and a pit bull. Me. That's all I need. It only takes a little bit of white brainwash to activate the cool chip in the average Negro. You think Harriet Tubman was walking around with a fucking nice shiny fucking dress on with a fucking crown on her head when she was taking slaves? To freedom! And a lot of white folk have demonstrated eloquently that they don't have no sense. back with the afrocentric podcast it's the second week of black history month i just want to say happy black history month to all the bitches that still wearing hazel contacts and they think they fooling us i want to say happy black history month to all the niggas that paid child support this month and i want to say happy black history month to bitches and niggas that still rocking mohawk rat tails and booster face now, the title of this episode is The Subtle Art of Dismantling White Supremacy. And we have a, an amazing, a powerful speaker we got in the building today. I want to introduce to you guys, Karanja. Go ahead and introduce yourself and speak to the people. What's up? My name is uh, Karanja Matori um, out of Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, just glad to be here today uh, uh, be up to speak with Morgan. So appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we are going to be discussing the second set of the characteristics of white supremacy in this episode. So some of the characteristics we'll be discussing is going to be the only right way, paternalism, either or thinking, power hoarding, as well as fear of open conflict. Now, in this episode, we will be divulging into the implications of those characteristics and their impact on different aspects of society. And we'll also be touching on the aspect of white supremacy, as well as the in in invisibility of white privilege, as well as the psychology of racial privilege in the United States. So I'm really excited to be talking to you. Is there anything you want to say to the people? Get off your chest before we start this conversation. Um, I don't know. Just ready to you know, get into the conversation. Let's just you know, see yeah. what happens. Yeah, fuck y'all. Uh, let's get ready to rumble. Right, Karanja. Um, here at the Afrocentric Podcast, we play a lovely game that I like to call Fight, Mary Kill, African American Edition. Now, for those who do not know and are new to this podcast, this game is a classic game of 
fuck, marry, kill with a little twist. And in this game, I'll be introducing to you a few African-American household names. And you're going to have to make a decision on whether you want to fight them, whether you want to marry them, or if you want them to be sleeping with the fish. All right. You ready? You. you ready? Yeah, All good. right. Paranja, fight, marry, kill. The Yin Yang Twins. Charles Barkley and Lunel. It, it just got to be two men. Well, you gotta fight somebody, and you gotta okay. kill. You gotta right. do what you gotta do. Uh, well, of course, I'm, I'm gonna marry L- Lunel. Why? Why wouldn't I? I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. Um, she's funny. She yeah, she can she's laugh funny. you up at them draws. Yeah, I like that. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> so that's the first one. Then fight. Uh, I I'll fight Charles Barkley because I don't agree with you know some of the stuff you know he he says. What Charles Barkley be saying? Um, I'm just a very opinionated person, and not to, and I'm not saying I, I hate that. It's just you no know, some of the, you no know, things like basketball related. I'm a basketball person. I don't agree with some of his takes. Wow, you know the only reason why I know who Charles Barkley is is because um Blueface said they baby look like him. <laughs> I seen that, but now nah, now nah, he he is a dope basketball player. Though. But is so, he the father? Is he the father? I don't think so. I hope not. And you gonna kill the yin yang twins? Unfortunately, yeah. Why you putting them down? Somebody gotta get that third spot. What? You gonna have both of them pushing up days? I hate it for you. What's your, okay. <laughs> what's your weapon of choice? I don't, I don't have a weapon. How you gonna kill them? By word of mouth? With kindness? With kindness. Wow, that's <laughs> so powerful. Well, thank you so much for playing this game, America's favorite game, Fight, Mary Kill, African-American Edition. It's ironic that you're sitting here and you're having three Caucasian people testify and tell you what their expertise are. Do you want to know what my expertise are? I just have to say that I object strenuously to your use of the word hilarious. Um, to me, this feels a lot like your reaction to being named in one of these manifestos. Now, you're, of course, not responsible for the words of somebody writing that document. But I do think that laughing at it is a real problem because these are real families that are impacted by this violence. And I think our efforts towards talking about this have to start from a place of mutual respect, which is what I've heard from from this side of the table. Now, the reason we don't have those numbers, I want those numbers as much as you do. But the number to say the numbers don't show something is simply not supported by the data. Uh, Ms. Owens, obviously this is a gang up on you. You know, we, we're, we're giving uh, these witnesses the ability to do a rebuttal on you. And so, um, you know, I, I find it unfair, Ms. Ballou. I mean, you know, candidly, for you to show mutual respect and then you to go after Ms. Owens, it's not appropriate. So, Ms. Owens, you can have four minutes and 34 seconds to respond. However, I'm going to yield for a second. I'll, I'll yield. To the... Thank you. Uh, I believe, Ms. Owens, when you used the word hilarious, it was, in, it was referencing the fact that no one had asked you a question. It wasn't to the subject matter of the hearing. Is that right? That is correct. And for ha- to have another witness insinuate something that is not accurate is just not appropriate, Mr. Chairman, for how witnesses are supposed to behave in front of this committee. I also think you didn't say it doesn't matter about the subject matter of today's hearing. You said there are other subjects that matter as well, and maybe we should spend some time on those. Is that accurate? That is correct, and they matter much, 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 much more. And I have said that. I said that in my opening, and I will say it again. You know that white supremacy and nationalism is nowhere near, ranks nowhere near the top of the issues that are facing black America. And the reason that you are bringing them up in this room is because it is attempt to make the election all about race as the Democrats. Not in my case, Ms. Owens. I'm sorry. Please do not characterize my motive. Mr. Chairman, it's my time. It's my time. You've got your time, Mr. Meadows. I'll give you three more seconds. Every four years, you bring up race, and you knew exactly what I meant when I said hilarious, and you just tried to do live what the media does all the time to Republicans, to our president, and to conservatives, which you tried to manipulate what I said to fit your narrative, okay? I was not referring to the subject matter that is hilarious. I said it's hilarious that we are sitting in this room today, and I've got two doctors and a missus, and nobody can give us real numbers that we can respond to so we can assess how big of a threat this is, because you know that it is not as big of a threat as you are trying to make it out to be so that you can manipulate. And the audacity 
of you to bring up the Christ Church shooting manifesto and make it seem as if I laughed at people that were slaughtered by a homicidal media maniac is, in my opinion, absolutely despicable. And I think that we should be above that. To try to assign reality or any meaning to a homicidal maniac writing a manifesto, which, by the way, let the record show, also stated Spyro the Dragon, the child's cartoon, as a source of inspiration. He also cited Nelson Mandela as a source of information. I don't think, I don't think that Nelson Mandela has inspired mosque shootings. You can correct me if you think I'm wrong. You, are, you would rather assign meaning to a homicidal maniac than to actually address that I said to, the things that I said today that are actually harming black America. Number one, father absence. Number two, the education system and the illiteracy rate. Illegal immigration ranks high, abortion ranks high. Supremacy and nationalism, if I had to make a list again of 100 things, would not be on it. This hearing, in my opinion, is a farce. And it is ironic that you're sitting here and you're having three Caucasian people testify and tell you what their expertise are. Do I know what my expertise are? black in America. I've been black in America my whole life, all 30 years, and I can tell you that you guys have done the exact same thing every four years ahead of an election cycle, and it needs to stop. All right, so in the first episode, we covered perfectionism, a sense of urgency, defensiveness, quantity over quality, as well as the worship of the written word. Now, in this episode, we will be focusing on the next five characteristics of white supremacy, and those are going to be only one right way, paternalism, the concept of evil or thinking, power hoarding, the fear of open conflict, as well as individualism. So my first question to you is, Karanjo, what is white supremacy? What is white supremacy? Uh, when I think of white supremacy, you know, I, I associate it with, uh, you know, what's, what, what has historically been going on in uh, America. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, white people that dominate, you know, society uh, when it comes to uh, the economy, politics, uh, social structures, uh, those type of things. And also, I try to relate uh, the definition of, of white supremacy to just the history of me. Uh, you know, when I talk to you know, my parents, especially you know who grew up in Mississippi, uh, you know, in the fifties and sixties, uh, you know, I kind of get them to explain their like their stories to me, like how was life you know, growing up for you? And they, you know, they, they and the way they explain it, I kind of relate back. I kind of relate it back to uh, white supremacy. Um, you know, growing up on a plantation, you know, that was life back in the day uh, for black people uh, being sharecroppers um, not your the, your family not having you know, high level of, ed, of education you know your parents have 6th, 7th grade uh, level of education um, not being able to vote you know, don't, don't even understand what don't even understand that concept you know, no type of economic freedom um, and you know these are black people you know, in, in the Mississippi Delta uh, in in Mississippi, and they're being affected by all the you know, aspects of white supremacy. Um, so you know, that's what it is. You know, unfortunately, uh, in America, you know that uh, part of uh, our of America's history um, and associated with you know uh, our culture and history in this country. Um, you know, you look at you know the Jim Crow, uh, you know, also played a significant part. Uh, in our history, as well as, you know, when you look at today, you know, the, you know, the effect that it has uh, in, in 2024 still. Um, so, yeah, white, white supremacy is a lot, uh, depend, really depending on in what, how you want to look at it, you know, if you want to associate it with white supremacy in sports, you know, white supremacy in politics and policy, uh, which is the field I work in. Uh, you want to associate it with, you know, entertainment. Uh, it's just, you know, uh, white society having a dominating, uh, are, are so dominant society, you, know, you have marginalized groups like African Americans historically, you know, who, who are affected by that. Uh, so yeah, that's white supremacy. 
Okay, so my next question is, is like, what is your personal relationship with white supremacy and how has it impacted you personally? Uh, personally, uh, like I said, I, I'll relate it back to you know, the situation I, I'm in now. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi. And, you know, I live in a city, you know, grew up in a city, you know, which I love and everything, but uh, it, it's affected by white supremacy, which in turn affects me and my outlook on things as well as the people around me. How? Um, when, you, when you just look at, you know, the, just the, you know, the, the opposite of investment, which is divestment in the community, um, you know, just, uh, no social issues uh, that that's going on, um, corrupt politics, um, leadership not effective. Uh, you know that 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 affects me and, and the people. You know my family that that's in the Jackson area, um, and, and Mississippi in general. You know uh, just so many different issues. Uh, you know education looks totally different, and in, in, especially in Jackson. Uh, you know I, I remember you know. And, you know, Jackson, you know, I'm a JPS alum, Jackson Public, uh, Jack, Jackson Public Schools, you know, so you know, I, I was able to you know, have you know, a great education to give me Jackson State and so on and so forth. But, you know, now, you know, I, I look back at the education system uh, now, you know, I got cousins and everything that's going, uh, you know, through K through 12 system, whatever, and it just looks completely different. Like, you know, I, I question, like, are our, our students really learning? Uh, I got a sister that that works in the public school system. Well, she did. You know, she just you know, got done uh, with that because you know just the way ed education is right now. Um, so yeah, it affects me in different ways. Uh, education and the people around me. Um, like I said, uh, politics, uh, leadership, uh, just mismanagement, and and no type of in community engagement where I'm at and where I've been all my life. Uh, so it is a different aspect. I think that's really well put. Um, I think that your perspective is interesting because just this this location alone, Jackson, it has like highest STD rates, highest jail rates, highest murder rates in the country. And I know a lot of people from this area specifically are extremely traumatized as well as like malnourished and i think when we when i think about white supremacy specifically about in jackson i think about um what is it it's environmental racism like environmental racism is when people within certain environments and they're they're the things that are supposed to be free like the air being clean, the water being drinkable, the land being livable, easy stuff to access, like yeah. like locations like this mm -hmm. or like Flint, um, they represent like that type of environmental racism where their government does not care about their well being down to the point where niggas didn't have clean water for a long time. So I guess I just wanted to See if you perceive it from that lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and not just you no, know, you no. Know, when you look at Jackson, Jackson is just a mirror of the state as a whole in a way. And you know, you look go up, you know, head north up of Jackson, and you just got the Mississippi Delta as a whole. You know, same issues, um, and you have uh, parts like this in Mississippi, which are you know, majority black. You know, Jackson Highs area, uh, the Mississippi Delta. Um, and you have all these negatives when it comes to education, healthcare, um, uh, employment opportunities, infrastructure, just, yeah, infrastructure, and money. And you look at all that type of stuff, and and you look at rankings. Uh, the rankings in, in this country, and Mississippi is close to last, and majority of. Um, and if, if if a lot of these issues are happening in your majority black areas like obviously there's some type of issue and something related to white supremacy 
that that's 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 causing all this. How do the characteristics of the only one right way and either or thinking manifest in different aspects of society and what impact do they have? Okay. So only only one right way is just the belief that there is only one right way to do things. Um either or is uh is it good or bad, right or wrong, uh either you're with us or against us. So what's an example? Uh an example um for for this type of thinking uh as it relates to white supremacy, uh I I'll probably just you know probably bring up politics. Um and when you think about the just the if, if if we were to do a study on just Donald Trump and politics, I feel like that that's the best way for me to explain it because mm-hmm. and just, and and really and when and when you really look at that that 2020 election of um of Biden versus Trump, you know there's either it's like it's literally a, it's either this way or it's that way. Like I, I when I look back when I look back at it and I was uh my, like my only like my only way of explaining to people like why you should vote is it's like Biden or Trump. Like which one do you want? You know what? That reminds me of like what's going on right now on social media, right? Okay. So on social media, um, ever since they started this war against Palestine and Israel, everybody's been like, you know, Biden is not going to win the presidency, right? Mm-hmm. But no one really wants Trump, especially like on the Democratic side. So you got people saying they're not going to vote whatsoever. And then you have the liberal white Democrats who are like scaring the people. If you don't vote or if you don't vote for Biden, it's not Trump's going to win. It's um, there's only one right way to go about this. And if you don't do it this way then Biden's going to lose. And if you don't vote for Biden, you're not black. Just all these different statements. If it's, it's only one right to go about doing it, or if you don't do it the way I tell you to do it, you're wrong. Yeah, and I feel like that's where politics has has really been the past couple of years. Uh, even before Biden versus Trump, you know, it was Hillary versus Biden, you know. Uh, and in some ways, it, it was the same uh, the, the same thing. Like we're 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 stuck. Like when, when it look when you look at social media and different things, like we're stuck between either this or that. Even when we think about like politics in totality, right? So like it's either you're Republican or you're Democratic, and it's it's a two party system. But it's like we don't even realize we fight for the same thing. Yeah, and, and I've always. I guess growing growing up uh, in my household, I've always uh, been able to see like, like I shouldn't be able to have to I shouldn't have to identify as either or. I should be able to identify with the party or you know the person that, that's running with the the issues that that they you know that they support or the issues that they want to push. Like it shouldn't like when you when you look at it historically, like as long as the two party system has been around, like. It was, I feel like it was never a good idea because it was just gonna lead to what's going on now. I think that's true. I think in totality, we really have to focus on how these characteristics really impact decision making, how people relate to each other, and overall the culture within um, organizations as well as in society as a whole like right now we're um we're going through you know the civil war that's going on brewing down in texas you know about that don't you uh can you explain that a little bit more yeah the civil war it's, it's a lot of it's, <laughs> a lot of it's, civil it's, wars it's, it's like it's just it's a lot of wars going on right now so like even like i'm just kind of like it's just too many wars so i can't keep up like it's just too much Okay, so... But, yeah, explain it, the Texas Civil War. Okay, so, um, you know, for the, like, for the last two years, Texas has been petitioning about um, breaking away from the country as a whole, and they've been making progress in it, but um, with the immigrant crisis we got going on right at the Texas border, um, they're 
their governor, Greg Abbott, has been putting up these fences like all around the border where Trump started yeah. and then finished his wall. He has Bob Wire fences. He's working this time. Oh no. So <laughs> <laughs> the um Supreme Court actually did a recent decision telling him that it was unconstitutional for him to have those um Bob Wire fences up because you know we are a land of the free home of the brave. We the home of the Milton Pie. Anybody should be able to come down here and do what they want. That's what America's about. So um they um they refused they refused to take the barbed wire fences down so joe biden sent um the army down to the um down to the border of texas to cut down this barbed wire while greg abbott who is the um governor of texas called the national guard so you know the national guard is under the command of the governor while the army is um they're under the command of the president so they're having a standoff at the border last i heard about it that's crazy yes it is <laughs> and it is the tensions that are going on like um you know even even within the black community even within the black community like <laughs> we have a really big problem with the either or thinking either you with us or you against us like that's like really really bad and i think it's the division between what an alpha male versus a, a feminine a woman high what is a high priority <laughs> high priority what, what they be what calling Kevin yeah said. what they call them first class bitches what is they a high, a alpha high i don't know i ain't got to that i don't listen to that like that world yet. i ain't got there yet yeah because it's influenced by white supremacy like the yeah. whole gender role shit is influenced by white supremacy and even people trying to combat it is either or like either you a man or a woman um and that's kind of real black and white to me like people have to understand that there's always a gray area in everything there's always going to be an outlier so there's no such thing as an either or so yeah and when you look back at the like the history of white supremacy and what it all entails you know that also includes classism sexism Fat phobia. Uh, yeah, clap, yeah I, like every type of issue, when, like when you say either or, when it relates to, you know, a certain type of thinking. Um, I mean, yeah, that that's true. So it's a form of white supremacy. And you got to come see us when you come to New York, VP Biden. Cause it's I a, will. It's a long way until November. We got more questions. You got more okay. questions. But I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. In what ways does paternalism contribute to the perpetuation of systemic inequality and how can it be addressed? All right, so uh, just starting off, you know, what is paternalism? Um, that is basically uh, the decision makers, the people who have power, you know, making decisions for others who, who necessarily don't. <clears throat> um, and I look at that, you know, when you look at a state like Mississippi, um, you know, when you look at the history of racism, uh, and just politics, and how and how it, how everything in Mississippi has played out up to this point, um, you get you know paternalism uh, when it comes to uh, different policies and everything. But you know, you, you look at look at it in, in various aspects of uh, uh, the the racial gap that's in this country. But when you look at Mississippi, you know, it's even worse. You know, black people aren't making a lot of money compared to uh, our, our white kind of counterparts. You talking about the pay gap? Yeah, the pay gap. I think it's interesting. Number one, I think it's interesting that when you see paternalism, the first thing you don't immediately think of is sexism. Because paternalism, paternal parent, parent father. Pick up! It's my baby boss. Lying, I'm the father of that baby boss. Boss. I'm that baby's daddy. Any fool can see that baby belongs to me. I want a different. That little rascal belong to me. Proud to say, boss, I'm that baby's daddy. I be the pa, boss. I'm the pa of that there youngin, boss. I'm the peppy. Through <laughs> <laughs> the outlet of white supremacy and racism, men always come first. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So the patriarchs 
contribute and it comes from Eurocentric thought and Eurocentric rhetoric. And I think it's strange because like even within the black community, like it's it's strange because black people will take the master's tools and try to dismantle the master's house. So especially we're seeing in the civil rights movement, a lot of black men took over led and were the forefront and the faces of the civil rights movement. Um, like today I just learned that um, the Freemasons play a huge role in the civil rights movement. And I had absolutely no clue whatsoever because it's never spoken of, but it's just like a random association. But what I do know is that black women, especially during the civil rights movement, had to step to the side, but they were doing majority of the work and they were and not even just black women you can continue going down the intersection gay men if they weren't considered straight like they weren't able to have the full capacity of power in which they were old regardless of how intelligent they were how much work they put in um martin luther king was a heterosexual straight black man so he got all the power and he looked yeah. right you look at people like ella baker Okay, let's look at Ella. Let's look at Ella Baker then, because Ella Baker specifically had to fight for her right to be able to be put in that forefront. But Ella Baker was the one who. It was because of Ella Baker that black um black people, especially in the Mississippi Delta, were even registered to vote. And it's because of things like paternalism, um, like the NAACP during the Civil Rights Movement they did not include lower class black people and that includes people within them and if it wasn't because of Ella Baker's ability to see within the intersection and pick out like those men and poor poor people as a general they wouldn't have never got registered to vote yeah so when you look at you know we're talking about paternalism or organization structure and you look at uh, organizations that were you know making impact in the during the civil rights movement, NAACP, NAACP um, SL, S, SL, SCL, SCLC, yeah, uh, Southern Leadership so, Council. Yeah, so when you look at all those organizations and you talk about the issues where you had a, you know, Ella Baker and the issues that she was facing, you know that, and you were, and you try to relate it back to white supremacy. Under white supremacy is classism, sexism, with Ella Baker and various other people who played a, a major impact during the civil rights movement, you know, they were affected by that as well. Yeah, because paternalism limits access to freedom. It restricts people. It doesn't allow people the full access that they would have if they were a man or yeah. a white man. And, 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 it, and in, in paternalism, it plays into the black culture as well when you look at um, well, the white skin versus black skin colorism yeah colorism like um uh, like don't even during you know the early times you know at hbcus at howard or whatever you know they you know you look back at the history and you know you couldn't be good you couldn't get into a certain organization if you weren't passing that brown paper yeah. bag yeah yeah so it it, play, it, it un unfortunately um just like i said through our history and just the overall history of white supremacy in this country uh, issues lead to that type of thinking amongst uh, black groups of people as well. If you are deconstructing from religion and or patriarchy, one thing you have to reclaim is gossip. This is from the book Witch, Witch Hunting and Women, where it talks about in early modern England, uh, the term gossip was really kind of like godparent or the people that as a woman you would be with in childbirth. And then eventually it just became known as your women friends, but it had no negative connotations. It's the kind of women that you would want to have if you were having a baby. And it wasn't until the 16th century that gossip got a negative connotation. And what happened is during that time, there was a strengthening of patriarchal forces and mechanisms, especially in excluding women from public activities and really demanding that women be confined more and more into their homes in servitude and obedience to their husbands. So in 1547, there was a proclamation that basically said that women were forbidden to sit around and babble and talk. And husbands were ordered to keep their wives at home. 
This contraption was invented to literally keep women from speaking. This picture is actually from the early 1900s and this is a real woman from Ireland who was in jail for speaking and gossiping. And this is where we start to see a separation with the term of gossip. When men got together and when men talk, it's productive, it's networking. Even if it's something that's not necessarily productive. So have you ever turned on ESPN and there are five men literally screaming, screaming at each other at the top of their lungs at which basketball player would be the best if they could only use their non-dominant hand? Like just some abstract question and they are screaming at each other and it is not called gossip. So gossip is often demonized by the power structure to keep marginalized groups like queer people or women or other marginalized groups from being able to share um, information and from being able to form groups that could challenge the status quo. So instead of seeing women as the ones who are fishing for rumors or starting gossip or being home wreckers or talking shit about other people or being petty or being, um, you know, bitches or whatever, whatever the narrative is, is there something powerful about gossip because it's how we communicate with each other and it's how we keep each other safe. This doesn't mean we have to be unnecessarily mean, but it does mean that I reclaim the ability to go to a place with women and talk about marriages and people and friends and what's driving behavior because it's giving me information about people. It's giving me information about myself. It's giving me information to be able to make choices on who I want to spend time with and what's a red flag and what's not. All of that is helpful information that I have reclaimed as not evil. So the second part of this question is, how do we address paternalism? How do we fix it within our community? Uh, well, it starts with, you know, um, the community knowing what's going on, because uh, that's when, when you're looking at paternalism, the reason why, it, why it's so successful is because the people that is impacting don't know what's, what's really going on. Um, when you look at uh, when, I, when I look at uh, like policy issues such as uh, last year um, through uh, through uh, Mississippi at the Mississippi Capitol they passed the HB 1020 bill uh, which was like a, you know kind of like a city takeover bill uh, with the city of Jackson uh, as it relates to uh, policing uh, and, and the governor being able to appoint uh, his own judges and prosecutors uh, through a special like through a, a special district, the Capital City District um, in Jackson. Uh, and, and when you have issues like that, when that issue was brought up, uh, you have to you have to make sure that people are 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 aware of what's going on in the community. Uh, you have to have those discussions and dialogue and bring more people in to like to the issues that are affecting them and get everyone on the same page. Um, I think that is an excellent way of combating it. I definitely think addressing for it and finding advocates for it is a great starter to trying to fix paternalism within communities. I think the problem that we're facing within our communities is the fact that we have to find a way to modernize it. We have to um, find a way to make it more modern and more appealing to people who are of our age because that community civil rights people the people that were there doing the rights and stuff they dying off they passing away so how do we how do we make it more modern how do what do you think people want to see in order to address this situation because i'm gonna be real with you anytime i address paternalism i get in big trouble <laughs> i do though but no that's that's the um whole point um no no it, it takes Know people like you who, you know, like what you said, like you can you can do that. But you need those type of people. You know that's why the civil rights movement was so successful. That's why, you know, even after the civil rights movement, you got people like Stokely Carmichael, uh, SNCC, Black Black Panther Party. You know they they were so successful because they their strategy was was different and they were on, on the same page on what had to be done. Uh, and when you look at you know it's 2024. And unfortunately, we're still having those same issues, um, like from the Reconstruction period to Jim Crow till now. Like we're still having the same issues, and, and people are still having having to fight 
Like we're still having to be reactive with with so many issues that's going on uh, in this country today. Um, I think that is excellent. Um, I was watching like a, a psychology documentary, right? Where they had like a hundred participants in one room. Now, now watch me. Let me cook. So within these one hundred people within this room, essentially. The test was to see, like, who was the most important person within the scenario. So you have one person who is, like, advocating for something, and they're trying to see how quickly people would rally up behind them. And the the results of the study was that it wasn't the person that was advocating that was the most impactful person within the room. The most impactful person within the room was the second, the first follower. So like, I could always be somewhere advocating for a group of people and people might see me, but it isn't until the first follower comes up and supports me, tells me that I'm right and shows solidarity within it that um, people started to actually pay attention and actually started believing maybe in the movement or the concept or the idea that the person was pushing. So I say that to say this. Um, I think ever since the death of Martin Luther King after the assassination of Malcolm X um, and with the downfall of the black church just in general, I think we're looking for a savior. I think that... It's not going to come. No, it's not. And I think that we should all have individual thoughts and I think we all should stop trying to be the one, the one person to advocate, right? I think that people need to understand that there's power in being the leader and there's so much power in being the first follower, the one that rallies and supports behind it because that's how you create momentum for a movement. Um, Yeah, those are my thoughts. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, When you look at uh, collective strategy and, and people being on the same page and no one has a as their own agenda, uh, you can really make progress uh, with that type of mindset, collective mindset as a people, uh, and that and that's and, and that can go with business, um, you know, politics. Uh, if you want to advance, advance, you know, whatever policy that you want to advance in that, uh, but it, it, it's it, it can happen. It can happen in so many ways. If, you know, if you have that collective mind. It's real. I think that, like, when we think about, like, black leadership, when we think about Martin Luther King, people have this common thought that Martin Luther King stepped up. Like, people think Martin Luther King stepped up to the plate when in reality he was appointed. Mm -hmm. Like, a group of people selected him because they felt like he was worthy enough. They felt like he fit the appearance. He was whitewashed enough. He was a very educated man. And he was a phenomenal orator. And an, an even better writer. He was so fucking intelligent. Like, when I went to college, that I had to do so many, like, analysis papers just on his work. So, like, I have a connection specifically to, like, his uh, letter in Birmingham jail. And you see all the different allusions he has to Pluto, Socrates, all yeah. these different um, psychologists, theorists. But it still, it was whitewashed until he started bringing up commit in the Greek gods and the um, fucking Egyptian pantheon, all these different things. So like, he That's, was selected. He yeah. he he didn't step up. And I just want people to know that like, if you ain't for a savior, be your own savior, and be the one to stand up for your community. And if you see someone else standing up for the community, rally behind them. Yeah, most definitely. Until the bright days of justice emerge. If you say you care about racism and you want to go on in this lifetime, it's very important for you to understand and know what it looks like. So far, we've covered right to comfort, perfectionism, sense of urgency, defensiveness, quantity over quality, and worship of the written word. I low-key covered only one right way in the last video too towards the tail end, so we're going to be covering paternalism today. If you want to take a deeper dive on any of these topics or see the work that I've cited, I'm going to link that in my link tree in my bio. I'm dropping hints that you shouldn't scroll. Per usual, I know you bitches don't like to read. I don't like to read either, so that's no judgment. So let's get into it. Point one, decision making is clear to those with power and unclear to those without it. 
point one bleeds into point two, which is those with power think that they are capable of making decisions for and in the interest of those without power. This is very pervasive in our society. Think, are you supposed to be in this park? Do you live here? Can I see some proof of residency? Do you have a permit? Meanwhile, you're a citizen like the rest of us. Another example of where this is pervasive is in the nonprofit industrial complex, where oftentimes well-meaning white people go into communities of color to fix the neighborhood, most likely without consulting anyone who lives in that neighborhood and without any intentions to distribute any of the power that they have into those communities that they're serving. Speaking of which, the third point is those with power don't think that it's important or necessary to understand the viewpoint or experiences of those with whom they are making decisions. Don't you fucking scroll. But again, the nonprofit industrial complex is a great example of that. Point four, those without power understand they do not have it and understand who does. While I can give an entire lecture on what standpoint epistemology is, I don't have time to do that. If you have time to Google it, I suggest that you do, but I'm gonna simplify it for you. People at the bottom of the pyramid can see the top of the pyramid very clearly. People at the top of the pyramid cannot see the bottom of the period. Clueless. Last point, those without power don't really know how decisions get made and who makes those decisions, and yet they are completely familiar with the impact of those decisions on them. Think gerrymandering. It doesn't make a lot of sense. We don't really know who the fuck is making these decisions and calls. Yet the impact it has on voters of colors can be seen and felt throughout our daily lives. Please. Can you provide an example of power hoarding and its influence on organizational dynamics and structural social structures? Yeah, so uh, power hoarding is just, you know, the, the power over resources and, and and is able to benefit the people that you know have that power. Um, when you look at a state like Mississippi, um, you know you look at some parts of the state, and you could you could ask the question: uh, Where where are our resources? Where's the the funding for this and that? Karanja, I swear to God, I ask the question every day. I mean, it... <laughs> I was asking the question last week. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, you good. When it was snowing in Mississippi, I said, "Where are all the snow machines?" You I know, <laughs> no, but that's the thing, though. Know, if if science tells you that we are going through um a, a global crisis because of what what is it with the it, what is, is global it? warming? Yes, we going through global warming. It's real. Global warming means that there are unpredictable weather patterns and structures. So, at the very least, if I had common sense and the resources. I would have one at least for every county, especially if the federal government is giving me money for stuff like that. Six people died. Six people died in snow in Mississippi because niggas don't know how to operate in <laughs> snow. Nope. So why wouldn't there be? Because where's the money? Bitch, you on here reading scripture. Where the fuck that money at, bitch? Where is the money in the shoulder? And then, hold on. My shoulder not even hop on the fucking day. I somewhere. Hey, I'm but, looking for uh, it. Nah, yeah, like you can, like just you look at, at at certain places in Mississippi, and you could ask, you know, like what's going there. Like there has to be some type of investment going to this place. If if it's going to this place in Mississippi, then why isn't why isn't going to this place? In like to y'all streets down here in Jackson. I, I, I don't know. Like we've been. It was supposed to be six years ago. No, because let me tell you, so my thoughts. They, um, Tate Reeves, who is the governor of Mississippi, is like proposing legislation to be able to cut, um, state tax. Phase out Mississippi's personal income tax by 2029. That's around the corner. That money would instead go toward economic development, highways, and the judiciary in your beautiful state. And you're asking for more spending on police in Mississippi's capital city of Jackson. You know, when I first read about this and knowing you were coming on the program, I said, well, that sounds a little bit like Florida. Tell me what you're, you're hoping to do. Well, it has been my goal to eliminate the personal income tax in the state of Mississippi because I just believe fundamentally that if you want more of something, you got to tax it less. And we certainly need more income. We've been driving per capita incomes up in our state. They're up 30 percent in the last five years. Major movement. Um, we've also cut income taxes um, numerous times over the last five years. Right now, there are nine states in America 
that have no personal income tax, but of the 41 that have one, Mississippi has the fifth lowest. Mississippi is a place where companies around the globe are choosing to do business because we have a very good um, business-friendly climate. We have low mm -hmm. taxes. Uh, we support uh, our businesses. But we believe that if we can continue to move towards the elimination of the income tax, to move to similar to states that we compete with every day, we compete with Texas, we compete with Tennessee, we compete with Florida, not only for economic development, not only for new capital investment, but we compete with them with population as well. We want more people moving into our state one way in which to do that is for us to fully eliminate the income tax. Well, and it's it's so interesting because people are looking to go to those places that are more like what you're describing because we are so overtaxed in blue cities. And if the jobs are where those better situations exist, you will get more people. Uh, thank you for telling me about that. I don't know how many people knew about it, but I, I, I really appreciate what you've done. You've pulled back and you had to make some budget you know, adjustments to do to live on fewer personal taxes from people, you're kind of getting the state off the dole of the taxpayers' money, and then soon you'll wipe that part away. That's fascinating. I'll check back, and thank you very much for being in focus. I was sitting up there watching the news with my mama last week, and I said, Lord have mercy. She said, what that mean? I said, okay, mama. So if they're going to cut state tax, right, all the money that you and me, we normal, regular, average nine to five Joes, right? Mm -hmm. And then they take money out of our checks for taxes, right? Yeah. Where do that money go to? It go to your community. Yeah. It go to the schools. It go to the public parks. It goes to building and development. So that means it's supposed to be going to the streets and the roads and to the bridges and shit. Somewhere. That's what it's supposed to be allocated for. But we just normal people. So they taking money out of our normal people checks and it ain't going nowhere so then you think about donald trump with the the tax cuts for all these rich people rich politicians these lobbyists all this so they have way more money than me and you joe they got they got money on yeah they got stacks so if they got all this money and they not paying taxes that mean a large proportion of the money that's supposed to be sanctioned for these cities ain't getting it and that's why you got big ass potholes in jackson because they don't they not allocating the funds and they're not getting the funds from the people who really got the money that's why you street for yeah and it's and it's it's in so many other aspects uh when i look at the school systems uh jackson now i graduated uh, high school in, in 15 and i don't remember any charter schools in the area uh but but now, like, there's just an influx of, of charter schools that, that take money from the public schools. Mm -hmm. And so. But they're not following none of the regulations and guidelines. They're not even, um, they're not even, like, the schools are not even, like, passing school. Uh, and, and you look at how, you know, how that, that's taking money from Jackson Public Schools and also is, is making the, the school district smaller. So now they got to know restructure the the schools and some schools got to get shut down they said the same thing about lebron's academy they said that they weren't passing none of their yeah. exams and grades and shit but they yeah. taking their federal money like when like and and that's how you can relate like this certain topic we're talking about when it comes to i, I think it's called school choice but you know you know all, all the, the charter schools you know that's that happened through policy um you know who made who made those policies that to where and you know it's just not happening in Jackson. Uh, it's all, it's happening in other parts of the country where it, the the charter schools are 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 taking over the public school system and taking that money away from the public schools. And they need it because again, Tavri's getting ready to put school summer lunches for the babies. I mean, I mean, and that's and that and that goes back to power hoarding uh, when you even look at um the medicaid uh the health care issues uh in mississippi uh we don't we don't have no uh like medicaid for for, for regular people in, in in our state in the state of mississippi well, um and, and you look at the mississippi delta that that's having a, a real life crisis issue when it comes to health care and people being served when it comes to the most basic needs i 
I completely agree with you. And I think that it's um, a huge problem um, because I guess the example right now is going to be the government and politicians. I know right now that people are extremely upset with um, the state of New York for several reasons. Um, Number one, they're upset because, well, it's not even the state. So the United States government is um, offering citizenship to any immigrant that decides to fight in the upcoming wars. <laughs> That's crazy. It's wild. <laughs> then on top of that. It's not their first time. Either. No, it's not. It's not at all. But it shows you the lack of morality of Americans right now because they don't want to fight in America's wars. I would. <laughs> I, I'm not. We are going to be sitting in jail and <laughs> looking at each other and laughing. Um, secondly, um, the state of New York is paying for immigrants to, um, get, I want to say a thousand dollar allowance for food within their, um, shelter. So they are giving them like a EBT service. They're also paying them to relocate because Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott then kicked them out of their state. So they're moving to places like New York because they're giving them money. So the immigrants, they getting like money money so it was i seen this one dog on video they they you know they stick together they they be yeah. they be hand to hand so they use this money and they bought an 18 wheeler they living and sleeping and breathing and eating in the 18 wheeler they done bought hot plates and they got extension cords they done hooked up the hot plates they cooking full-fledged meals they put them in styrofoam containers and selling it food that they get for free from the government yeah. to the people, the other Mexican construction workers at different sites. Yeah. And they making that money back. Plus some, um, them motherfuckers got hammocks hooked up to 18 wheelers, scratching on lottery tickets off the government. Yeah, I, I'll say this about uh, just you know everything going on with that. Because like, I guess like immigration policy and just the study of that, I'm not the, the biggest person on, on that on that topic but like it's gonna like for me it's gonna be i really want to see like you know what what this country looks like in the next five to ten years just based off you know when you just said talk, when you talk about the stuff that's going on in texas right now with immigration and uh florida with the sanchez with you know them basically like they kicking people out mm-hmm. like, like what like what impact is, is that gonna have in the next couple of years and then you look at this presidential election either or it's only it's either you know, biden's um policy on on issues like this or, or you, you want to make Trump. america great again and and either way is like both both of like both of them are like it's just so it's polarizing for e- either side of the spectrum if you on the right side and you're looking at what Biden has to offer, you already know what, what their mindset is. Mm-hmm. And if you on the other side and you looking at the whatever whatever Trump or on that or whatever that side is called, what they have to offer, it's like it's uh, a lose lose situation. Lose situation, and that's, they, and that's policy for the past couple of years. It is, but they are hoarding their power now. Back to the conversation about the immigrants, like. You, they got so much money to be able to give them all this, all these different resources, and you got niggas down here in Jackson, born down here, like real life, born on this soil, struggling to eat. They don't, we don't even know where the ten of money at down here in Jackson. We got issues with the SNAP financial aid, all that money shit down there, but they got resources. So the government is okay. Another example, I give you another example. Also in New York. They done in 1997. The government in New York created a government to be able to collect and give out and allocate funds to Holocaust survivors. Somehow, the governor of New York found 183 million dollars to give to the victims and beneficiaries of Holocaust victims. This is your reminder that the Holocaust did not occur on American soil. However, they found $183 million to give to the victims and the beneficiary. Walk with me through history for a moment. 
on Juneteenth of 2019, the House Judiciary Committee here held a hearing on slavery and reparations. See that man right there? That is Mike Johnson from Louisiana. He was a House Congress representative. Do you know he is now the seated speaker of the, the House who holds the power of the purse in this country? This man fought tooth and nail against the case for reparations in 2019. It is on video. The hearing is three hours and 19 minutes long. Watch it. Because he and people like Candace Owens were fighting tooth and nail to say that black people do not deserve reparations. Because it is unconstitutional. Even citing his adopted black son as a reason for it. Now back to the governor and what they did in New York. They, meaning the Department of Financial Services, Holocaust Claims, processing office. They have a whole office for Holocaust claims. They assist Holocaust victims with their heirs recover stolen assets and they have helped secure and return over 183 million in compensations to victims and their heirs for bank insurance and other material losses. Additionally, through the initiative, the Department of Financial Services has facilitated settlements involving over 250 cultural objects since its inception in 1997. They have been doing this since 1997. Again, the Holocaust did not occur here. However, since 1997, they have put this initiative together and as a collective have found $183 million, which means they structurally put something together to ensure that they can be compensated for a loss that occurred in another country that did not occur in ours to get reparations. At what point will y'all stop playing in our faces? Mm -hmm. So where did Holocaust happen? Yeah. Well, you got to say it now because everybody don't know where the Holocaust happened. Happened in Europe. Yeah, happened in Europe. <laughs> so if it's over there and they, they didn't had all this money, they done came up, I want to say, with $322 million to give back to the descendants of Holocaust survivors for a tragedy. Now it is a tragedy, but it didn't happen here. But they ain't got no money. They ain't got no sympathy or no resources for the niggas, the descendants of the enslaved people that they took from Africa and brought down here. They ain't got no money for us at all. They said that slavery was a choice that um we learned skills in slavery and we need to be great no, it's all <laughs> of them but they hold that power Ram DeSantis said that we learned skills in slavery nika Haley said we ain't never been in a racist country she ain't never seen it yep. according to her well they got the power and they holding it they hoarding it i mean that's what the kids gonna end up learning they, that slavery unless you teach them at home happen. Or you put them in a programs outside of the government that truly teach them their history and they're they're here they're available black people have a blindness to different organizations and 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 institutions that are there for them they're always saying they're looking for it but there are thousands of institutions and resources here they never want to go find them. they can google boosted lyrics they can they can figure out who the fuck shot off but they can't figure out no program that'll help them pay their light bill and help them get money for daycare. I mean, you want people like TikTok or whatever you talking about? I don't know. Like that's like that's what's going on now. I mean, it is what it is. My take on the migrant crisis is similar to my take on Barack Obama's presidency. Barack Obama's presidency did not signal the end to white supremacy in America. It signaled a reinvention to white supremacy in America. If you are a politically astute Caucasian, you know that. You were not threatened by Barack Obama being president because you knew he was nothing but a puppet for the white power structure. But if you were a politically uneducated Caucasian, you might think Barack Obama being in the White House is a taking over of federal power by black America. The same thing with the migrants. The migrants are being allowed into the country and for two important reasons. And there's several, but there's two very important ones. Voting. Voting is one. And attached to that voting is the replacement of black America at the ballot box. 
Joe Biden knew he wasn't going to do anything for black people. And if you go back to his original campaign when he was elected the first term, he said he wanted to fast track to American citizenship four to eight million undocumented immigrants. Why is he making this promise before he even gets into the White House? Because he knew he was going to do nothing for black people. So if I'm not going to do anything for black people, they're not going to vote for me. How does the Democratic Party make up for the dwindling black vote? We're going to bring the immigrants in, turn them into citizens, give them the right to vote. Thereby, we reduce our dependency on the black vote on election day. I saw this coming. I spoke on it. Black America didn't believe me, and now they're living it. So the immigrants are being allowed to come in to replace us literally, metaphorically, physically, and every other way. You look at what they're doing in New York City. You look at what they're doing in Chicago. I'm always in New York. I just came from Chicago. They are literally giving these migrants black people's resources from food stamps to housing to jobs to clothing, you name it. Taxpayers are not getting what they pay for, but folks who never paid tax a day in their life, nor whose ancestors built this country, are being completely ignored. It's the takeover. And the reason they're choosing New York and Chicago as the most aggressive migrant replacement efforts is because those are the two strongest black political cities that we have. If you take New York, you take Chicago, you take black America, the rest of us are easy. But as I travel America, guess what? There's migrant camps in nearly every black community I'm coming across. I was in Kansas City. They got a migrant camp. Philadelphia has a burgeoning one. I just came from Antioch. They have one. Sacramento, they have one. They're popping up all over the place where black people are because they're going to be the new minorities once America gets rid of us. The second reason they're letting the migrants in is to keep big businesses in America. Cheap uh, labor. Absolutely. Cheap labor. Cheap labor. Because what the corporations is telling the government, if I have to stay here, I got to pay for all kinds of labor insurance. You know, if somebody gets pregnant, they get off. If they have a mental health problem, they get off. I got to pay them. It costs me too much to operate a business in America. If you want me to stay, you better bring some of them brown people from across that border and let me pay them pennies on a dollar under the table. And the reason they love the brown people instead of the black people is because we are an obligation to America. We built it. We built it. <laughs> so we're an obligation. We're the nuisance that they don't want. But when brown people show up, their ancestors didn't build this country. They come into a place better than the place that they're leaving. They will keep their mouth shut. They will not agitate. They will never become a political problem because they feel it is a blessing just to be here. Brother, they, they were literally spending millions of dollars to house these people. Yes. It's like millions. And, and why is that the, why do they feel like that's the best use of the resources? Because we fail to recognize that capitalism isn't the white man's priority in America. It is racism and white supremacy. There is no amount of money America will not pay to rid itself of the unwanted Negro. People say, look at all the money they spend to keep us in prison. They can spend a third of that and improve the schools. You don't get it. This is not a money game. This is an extermination game. Whatever they must do to get rid of black people, they will do it. You know what the American dream is? The American dream is not a big house and a big car and a big bank account. The American dream is to wake up and walk outside and not see a single black person anywhere in sight. That's the American dream. How does the fear of open conflict hinder progress towards racial equality? And what strategies can be employed to address these challenges? Um, so, yeah, what what is uh, fear of open conflict? Um, you know, basically, that's people in power that you know, are scared of of conflict and, and what the the marginalized group of people might say or what impact they might want to combat uh, versus them. Um, look at fear of open conflict. You know, during the civil rights era. Um, you know, Mar Martin Luther King, all those, you know, um, civil rights leaders, you know, they were creating, uh, they were creating fear amongst the, the public um, when, when they started doing uh, every, all the nonviolent uh, protests and everything. And you were able to see, <clears throat> and, and, and people at home are able to see what's going on, what's actually going on in this country. When, that's when, and, and leadership 
have to then react to that. Um, what you about I, to say? Yeah, so um, I think that when we think about the fear of open conflict, you can actually really see it during slavery. Let's talk about Nat Turner's slave rebellion. Nat Turner was born into slavery on October 2nd, 1800 in Southampton County, Virginia. His enslaver was a white man named Benjamin Turner. Nat was passed down to Benjamin's son, Samuel Turner, when Benjamin died in 1810. Turner was deeply religious and very intelligent and learned to read and write at a young age. Through his teenage and young adult years, he got visions from God that eventually led to the slave rebellion. He was purchased by a slave master named Joseph Travis in 1830 and then Nat got another vision, that to slay your enemies with their own weapons. In 1830 and 1831, he enlisted the help of over 70 enslaved and freed black people. August 21st, 1831, the rebellion began. They traveled from plantation to plantation with blunt instruments, axes, and hacksaws, killed any white person or enslaver in their path. They were eventually defeated and captured by the state militia. They evaded capture for six weeks, but was captured on October 30th, 1831 in Southampton County. Tongo November 11th. At Turner's rebellion truly stirred a fire, fanned the flames that eventually led to the Civil War and the abolition of slavery. Um during enslavement like oppressors were really afraid of rebellions mm -hmm. and that's the reason for slave codes they were afraid of Annette Turner or what the I know they heard rumors of what happened in um, Haiti with yeah. the Haitian revolution they were afraid of that and that's why they kept us so like severely oppressed because we outnumbered them like, like it was a crazy amount of outnumbered look at um i feel like one of the most pivotal uh time periods in american history that really defines where black people in this country are at uh, is when you look at the reconstruction period uh which was a period you know right after uh the civil war emancipation Abraham, yeah, emancipation by Abraham. You look at all that and you look at the years following that was probably the most aggressive time period for African Americans in this country. It, it was, was also one of the most dangerous and bloody time periods for African Americans. Mm -hmm. Like, that, and it's like, I feel like it shows you how afraid they were of, like, that type of conflict. Yeah. Because they retaliated before niggas could even yeah. do anything. Because they, uh, I read this book called Redemption uh, and it talked about uh, the Reconstruction uh, period and when you look at, you know, you know, in just them, those first couple of years of black people having their freedom, you know, they're in they're in political positions. Uh, John R. Lynch, uh, the street Jackson State is on, uh, was one of the first black uh, representatives um, in the country. In the country, is from Mississippi, which a lot of people probably don't know or try to acknowledge. Um, but you you had people in political in, in political positions on a local level in the state and in the state level and uh white people at that time you know they they saw that as a threat like like they, they like they really saw like black people holding positions holding positions amongst them as a threat and like you said it, it led to a very violent period which also led to jim crow that is quo um that that, that, that led to you know the was that another voting law suppression? Yeah, all types of yeah, everything up to you know Martin Luther King and those type of uh, acts in the 1960s. What that, the Black Panther Party had them? Yeah, yeah. Like when they, uh, when, yeah, when when Martin Luther King started talking about uh, jobs and economics, that's when fear of open conflict. Now he's a problem. Then, like, you know, towards the end of his life, he was getting to that point where he was starting to see, like, the vision that the uh, Black Panther Party carried. And he was getting to the point where he wanted more than just job opportunities and equality. He wanted full liberation, full equity. Okay? And they that, that is what made it a problem. That's what made him a problem. So they had to get rid of him. And then soon after, all our leaders failed. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about, like, right now. Because um, it's getting rowdy out here in these streets. Because, um, like, with the Alabama-Birmingham brawl, like, <laughs> that is a great example of the fear of open conflict. You want to talk about it? About that, about, about that brawl. brawl. Oh, yeah, that was crazy. I think. What were you when you first saw the brawl? 
Do you remember? I don't know where I was at, but I do remember uh, like somebody old I know. They sent it to me because uh, they they thought it they thought it was a shoe at first because they had purple shirts on, uh-huh. but it was it was a high school class reunion shirt. Uh, but yeah, it was just crazy. Like it was just viral. Like my mom, I, I knew it was crazy because my mom was like, she just be all in my face. Yeah, my mama too. My mom saw it on the news. <laughs> yeah, I get on social media like it's full of breakdowns of the fight, like play by play, play by play analysis and everything. So I mean, it was very, it was entertaining. It is now. I think that along with just the what I consider white people's kryptonite is them knowing or others knowing that he that they are racist like openly, and that is a great example to me. The fear of open conflict. So, like, within, like, white society, white culture, I feel like it's already an undertone of things being understood that when they at home with their people, they get a little flip at the mouth. You know, we know that when y'all white people is at home, that y'all say the N-word, and y'all be calling um, Mexicans with bags, and y'all be, you know, running off at the mouth because that's what's in y'all culture. But when white people leave the house and they get a, in another group of white people, regardless of where they from, uh, they all have this private understanding that you know, well, you racist but we racist within this circle but anybody outside of what's going on, they not gonna know because that is their kryptonite. So as soon as a white person is like accused of being racist or someone openly like admits to them or something like is exposed or something, that's the fear of conflict. People will stop associating with them, even if they privately know that they racist. If it's a publicly known thing, they'll become extremely ashamed of themselves. They are guilty of that. So, like, I feel like that is a great example of the fear of open conflict. Yeah, yeah I look at, uh, you look at, you know, the year 2020 and everything that went on that summer, uh, you know, all the protests and everything. And you know that that's a, a great example I fear of the, what can happen. You know, open you know, the fear of open conflict. That was a lot of open conflict conflict going on that year, um, and and especially when it came to social media and everything uh, in this country. And then you know all that kind of led to <clears throat> of, of of a way to kind of attack. Uh, no, the fear of open conflict when, when it as when you related to uh, DEI mm, diversity, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh huh. And you look at you know when everything that in 2020 that was going on, what was their uh, solution? DEI. Mm-hmm. But you look you look four years later, and it's like a rolling back of of what was of what we thought was the solution, which was DEI. Uh, let's talk about it. All these programs and whatever associated with DEI and and all that. Um, now like, they petitioning to get rid of it. Yeah, like um, and these big corporations yeah. that putting out all this information are secretly supporting it behind the scenes, like lobbying they, they, behind they, it. They were from the beginning. I know it because but, it's a facade. They don't. They they. It's a fucking facade. It's a masquerade. Them folks don't really care. If they feel if if the public feels like they are on their side, they'll give you their money. But if there's an open conflict and they lose the public's favor, they're gonna lose their money because this is a capitalistic side. Yeah, like you look at uh Florida, um, you know, re- removing all the D- DEI from like their colleges and everything. And uh, you know, it's the same thing uh they trying to do in Mississippi. Um Look at you know DEI, critical race theory, you know just those, just the the name of those topics alone scare scare people. Man, when I tell you I was at the plug house the other day. The plug. Yes, <laughs> I was I was at the plug house yesterday. I be in a trap with him, and you know he has um a mixture of clientele. He has the whites and he has the blacks. Very diverse. Very diverse DEI. So everybody can get served equally and equity and inclusively, you know, and it's yeah. So um, I'm sitting up there, I'm high fucked, and everybody, it's February, Black History Month. Everybody walk through the door, 
have black history month i'm saying have black history month all my niggas in my mind if i could say it to the niggas i could say it to the white people too man i said that shit and they again fear over conflict the white girls they were so happy they walked through the door i said happy black history month and they said happy black history month they got their little dime bags and they little the we the niggas up in there got on my ass because of the fear over conflict more than you fucking on my money you can't be saying shit like that up in here i'm like i'm sorry i'm sorry but i i believe in equity i feel like if i could say it to you i could say it to them too okay that yeah it's a true story in 1791 bukman a former slave and voodoo priest gave the historic signal to launch a slave revolt with the beat of voodoo drums. Drums that sounded the death knell of slavery in Haiti. What gave them their power? What gave them their inspiration? The gods of Africa. The gods of Africa who were reclaiming their own who were reconstituting their families, who were refusing to serve anymore under slavery. Must be remembered that the initial act of rebellion was, in fact, a votive ceremony. On a night in 1791, Bukman performed the ritual sacrifice of a black pig. His followers all drank its blood and swore their allegiance, vowing to shed the blood of their oppressors until the slaves were freed. Decades of hatred burst forth in a single night in a revolutionary spiral that sent the plantations up in flames, flames that were seen all the way to the Bermudas. It would be for another former slave, Toussaint Louverture, to lead the people of Haiti to independence from the French. Though Louverture would himself die in the struggle, his followers won their freedom. In one of the most astonishing military victories in history, the ill-equipped slave defeated the might of Napoleon's forces, considered the finest in the world. What was the secret of the slave's triumph against seemingly impossible odds? Did they, as some have suggested, draw upon supernatural voodoo powers? They fought with such terror and ferocity was because they knew that in victory lay freedom, in, in, in capture awaited tortures of the most hyena sort, and in, 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 in death awaited only a return to the mythical homeland of, of Guinea, of Africa. They created an independent black republic in the middle of slave-owning societies. That sent a ripple of terror throughout all of the slave owners throughout the whole Western Hemisphere. What if that were to happen in Brazil, in the rest of Central America, or in the Caribbean, or in the United States? Fearing the spirit of freedom would prove contagious, terrified slave owners on neighboring islands isolated the fledgling nation of Haiti. And voodoo drums were considered so dangerous that they were banned throughout the Caribbean. Tragically, though Haiti would win independence in 1804, the Haitian people would be subjected to harsh tyranny at the hands of their own countrymen. The very belief in voodoo which had spurred them to win their independence would be used by their rulers to oppress them. What strategies can be used to address the strategies implied by the fear of open conflict? Uh, well, first you gotta just have a discussion. Like you have to be able to identify, you know, the elephant in the room. Um, you gotta have open dialogue about the situation, um, and also accountability uh, plays a part into this as well. Uh, when it comes to you know setting the the goals and objectives of what needs to happen, you know, you know, also you have to have a group, a collective of people that are, that are able. To, uh, to hold those that are in charge accountable as well. Yes, you do have to hold the hoes accountable. I really, I really agree with that. Um, how do we hold, I like, how, 
I feel like social media is a great example of how we hold white people accountable, but there's virtual, there's cyber. Like, I feel like people treat the cyber world and the real world like two different realms. They don't, like, mesh for them. Do that make sense? Uh, can you explain? Okay, so, like, okay, motherfuckers, they got the Twitter fingers. Like, yeah. people be on social media acting tough. We all know that. But from the Caucasian side of the tracks, they they have had no profile, no no information, whatever. They literally troll on social media. I'm a victim of this. My podcast it attracts all the crackers and the the clownery. I'm telling you. So you got people that are never post nothing a day in their life, never had the courage to put their face on their on Instagram, social media, nothing. But they literally spend their time going through people YouTube comments just to say negative vulgar things. So how do you address it? My mindset is like if someone says something crazy to me, like I just let it sit there so people can see the foolishness going on. I'm not finna address people that's not as smart as me. That's just a waste of time to me. But like it's very rare nowadays that people will say something out of pocket in public unless they are like off them drugs, off that that dial water. Or if they like, you know, they just vulgar and rude and don't care, or they got audacity. So like combating stuff like the fear of open conflict, racism, prejudice. How how do you dress them in the cyber world versus the real world? Um, well, you just have to be truthful. Um, and like when it comes to education, uh, we're not they're not telling the whole truth in the classroom, and that's what that's that's to the that's where to the point where they want to get it. They're they don't want to address the whole point. They want they don't want to teach the whole history. Is it my responsibility to teach motherfuckers? As a what? As as a black person, just a normal black person, is it my responsibility to teach people? I feel like it is because um, like like it, it wasn't like I like growing up. No, I was in a you no know, a mentorship program. Uh, that my dad had started and him and other, you know, uh, black men that were educated and, and, and exposed us to reading, to different types of readings, you know, they did that on their own time. I I just, I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't. Now, if you take your fat ass hand and slap me in my face, you, you know what you did were wrong. Why would I sit here and tell you out my own mouth, Ronja, you wrong. You done backhand me in my face. You got rings on your fingers. You ain't even put no grease on before you hit me. My face almost caught on fire. Like, why would I have to sit up here and explain that to you if you know deep down inside and you feel guilty about it? Why I got to tell you? Well, so you talking about as in reference to white people? Yes. Why I don't understand it. I don't feel like it's my responsibility to educate white people about stuff that white people know that they did wrong. That's why they so, feel guilt. That's why the term white guilt is a phrase. So why do you feel whose responsibility is it? The individual. Is the there, individual is their responsibility. Just like our black history, our morality and our, our thought process is taught within our households. It needs to be taught within their households. Now, first of all, it's their parents' responsibility. Uh, realist, realistic no realistically okay i'll tell you this um, so it's this story right now about this man who got um a dna test right all his life all his life he said i'm italian i'm a true italian white man he he go 23 and me he done spit in the cup even put a little sperm sample up in there <laughs> just in case it get lost and the, the, the dna results come back four weeks later he find out he Bulgarian. <laughs> and he called his grandma, grandma, what the fuck is this? I've been eating pasta and lobster, ravioli, That's boy, shell boy, y'all D my, got that shit tatted on my arm. I'm yeah. think, I'm thinking I'm Italian. But now the, the truth and came out, I'm learning that I'm Bulgarian. And then you done found out that your grandma been lying this whole fucking time because her family belonged to a Bulgarian mobster family and they've been running for crime for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. They lie to the people within their family to keep those secrets. It's, it's so many instances right now to this day of people finding out 
that they even though they thought they was European, they found out that they German and their families was Nazis and they came over here to start over again and their families kept it from them because they didn't want that to affect them. It is the responsibility of the parent. If your mom and daddy didn't teach you that shit, it is your personal responsibility. You got Google. They do have Google. Google is free. But what about all that, that misinformation that, that people would rather read than the truth? You got a library. Who goes to a library? Is that my fault? Is, it, is that my fault? There's Even if you could say there are online libraries. People don't don't read what they want to read. They, and, they, I mean, but you know, sometimes we gotta read what we don't want to read. I it's been several times I've been in different situations where I had to read pamphlets and manuals I didn't want to read, but I had to do it because I needed to know the information. If I'm fucked up, if I'm going around calling people oh, motherfucking monkeys and orangutans and gorillas and people getting offended and I don't know why, maybe I need to do some self evaluation. I'm not making excuses for white people. And I feel like more people need to take that approach. What role does the invisibility of white privilege play in perpetuating the characteristics of white supremacy? And how can it be effectively addressed? So I feel like the best way I can describe white privilege right now is Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift. Oh, you know that um niggas going in the barbershop <laughs> asking for that Travis yeah, Kelsey. That's, that's white privilege. <laughs> How is that white privilege, Karan? No, I'm just talking, but uh, yeah, that is, is white privilege. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is. I was I was being funny, but it, it definitely it is. is but, uh, white privilege is you no know, uh, just white people, um, you know, having the advantages and opportunities that you know somebody that as as black like me might not have the same educational background or wealth background that they don't have you know they have and it's if they know it or not you know white right if they know if they know it or not that white privilege exists you know some people don't like want to admit admit that they have white privilege okay but the, um no it, it's still a thing um okay so like what do you say to the rednecks down in tuscaloosa alabama that say white privilege don't exist. I don't get no white privilege. I live in a trailer park. I ain't even got no teeth in my mouth. First off, roll tide. She said that because I got a uh, Bama sweatshirt on. I said that because it's a lot of honkies in Alabama. That's why I said that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't give a piss about nothing but the tide, baby. I don't give a piss about nothing but the tide. Blitz, Bama, Blitz, baby. Blitz, Bama, Blitz. I love America and I love the tide, baby. I won't call it. You probably. I did. But yeah, but you, 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 you saying why would they? Why would they say that white supremacy don't exist when they're on the same economic level as us and they go through discrimination? They got drug problems just like the rest of us black people. I mean that's true, and that also goes back into you know classism still exists. Um, but that mindset that that mindset of white supremacy still exists, mm-hmm. even though the, the that, that, that classism exists within as well. Explain. Um, no, like I said, you can like it. I I, I don't. I, I'm not in, in a white poor person's mind mindset understand you know if you were to talk to them they'll they'll still you know have the characteristics of being racist and, and feel like they're they might be superior to black people because that's what white supremacy is and, and that and you see that in a lot of cases of uh, you know individuals who white individuals who are poor poor or live or in the same uh economic class as marginalized groups of black people but they still have that mindset I, I i personally can't explain it it's just the mindset they have that's powerful Karanja. i know you did the best you could with what you got sure um so when we're talking about the individual indivisibility of white privilege like what what does that phrase like mean the, in, the invisibility uh-huh like, like it, it doesn't exist 
was not was not a real thing. Because it's normalized, right? Like through my lens, through my gaze of life, I'm privileged, and I'm so privileged. And my privilege, I come in contact with it so often. It's normal. It's a way of life. So I don't realize it because I am a perpetual or it's perpetuated towards me, white privilege. But it is because of the environment. It is because of the amount of resources, access to resources, and the fact that they had a head start from other minorities, truth be told. So that is what is meant when I say, we say the invisibility of white privilege. So much so that like the individualism you know how when horses are running on the track, they got blinders on? Yeah. That, that is how it is. Yeah, that, yes, they can't see anything outside of their realm and yeah. their quality of life. Yeah, and that, and like I'll, like for me, you know, I grew up in Jackson, so I grew up in, I grew up in a majority, black everything. Like I, I grew up my whole life being black. Uh, but that's, but for a white person that has, you know, their environment mm-hmm. 24 7 they're not they're not seeing black people or, or just having really regular conversations or if they really don't understand or unaware of race and what's really going on in this country they they can not they can those things might not like really like that they might not it don't, to click their mind. To it them. don't click to them and and then then you have those uh we call them the wiggles the um the ones that grew up in the affluent black neighborhoods and maybe had a black foster mother or they next door neighbors or their best friend was black yeah so they feel like white you know they don't see no color now they don't see no color they they everybody equal because they grew up around them what do you say to people like that because they'll tell you white supremacy because they grew up with because they next door neighbors and they dog was black they all mm-hmm. it don't it don't mean this. So what do you mean? What what would I tell them? Yeah, because they gonna say white supremacy don't exist. Um, for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's just based off their their environment. Then, like, it's an environment thing. If a like like the, the situation I was using was a white person that that, that grows up in a, a white environment, mm-hmm. they're not exposed to to just history or like what's going on currently um so they they don't they don't see white privilege um you know what you're referring to you know a white person that that that's growing up around black people or have no in, black impacts around them mm-hmm. they they have a different mindset to where I'm they, different. Sh- they should be able to see it i'm saying i'm pretty sure some do see i feel like some they do, do see it I'm just trying to get at a specific point. I'm just trying to get at the point that regardless of what type of environment a white person is in or what background they come from, to a certain degree, they all have white privilege. They will always be favored over a minority. Yeah, even if they don't know it. And I don't like to use that word, minority. What word would you like to use? Um, marginalized group of people well that's real because white people aren't even the majority anymore the yeah yeah, hispanic community has officially surpassed minority status and the only reason why i say that because when i was uh back in uh, college i went to jack state undergrad and uh, i had a professor we were always like uh, it was was one i forgot what political political science class it was but we'll always you know when we talking you know we'll might say minorities and he will ask like what is a minority? Who are you referring to as a minority? Like that's not a. Like, what are we the minority of? Especially as Black people in Mississippi, we are the majority. And, and we are the majority, and that and that goes for any like race of people. Like, I, I just don't like that. I just like ever since like uh like he always, you know, pointed that out to us. Like I always, I, I'm always careful to be like to use that word minority versus marginalized group or whatever term i want to use no i got a word like that too so like i don't never say slaves you'll never hear me call anyone a slave or you'll never hear me call someone like uh, a slave owner because um there are different versions of slavery throughout history and all over the world so when i'm referring to like african-american 
people through the diaspora who were here to endorse enslavement, I call them the enslaved. I call them enslaved people and not mm-hmm. slaves. And if I'm talking about a slave master, then I will call him an oppressor or an enslaver, yeah. like just out of respect. Yeah. I I understand um like using that terminology versus the other one. Yeah, because it generalizes stuff. Yeah, and it normalizes it too. It's not specific enough. Yeah, I feel you. So, how do we effectively address the invisibility of white privilege? Um, just like everything else, you gotta talk about it. Um, do you really think talking about it isn't enough? Because there's plenty of motherfuckers out here running their mouth off, and they not doing the work, Karanja. And you definitely is a nigga that be doing the work. Well, how, how would you address it? Because I, I I'm I not the interviewee. I don't have an answer for it. I'm not saying your answer wrong. I would say, how do you address the invisibility of white privilege outside of talking about it? Shit, I ain't got no answer either. <laughs> <See? laughs> outside of talk, I um, mean, I can't make nobody see something they can't see. You have to prove it. And like, in order for people to see it, they have to see it through like statistical data. And even when people see statistical data, they don't believe yeah. it. Like, I mean, um, there's so much data out there. And people just like, overlook it. I'm saying, it's just so much data related to why racism is bad. Why It exists. Just the fact that it merely exists yeah, is a but, problem. But it's still here. I know so. it. And it's taken over. Um, I think, like I say, you know, when it comes to like hiring processes, specifically in America, I think that's where we really start to see like the invisibility of white privilege. And we already know the data behind that. If your name looks yeah. ethnic, it gets thrown away. If you have, like, we already know that if a white man is a felon and you as a regular black African-American man, that white felon is more likely, statistically speaking, to get selected over a job role over you and you may be more yeah. qualified. And I feel like it's so hard to kind of address uh, white privilege. We gotta infiltrate the spaces. That's what That's, we gotta do. We do. That's the. <laughs> yeah, you're right. you're right. You have to infiltrate the spaces. Yeah, you have to have more people in the spaces, but we haven't haven't got to that point. We have. There are a lot of black women specifically infiltrating white spaces. It's, Is it enough right now? Um. Like the statistics say that it's a lot of black women in corporate places. Um, a lot of black women starting businesses, but I don't know because when it comes to like the invisibility that comes with gatekeepers, and I think that's the, another huge problem with white supremacy is that in um, infrastructure, resources, access to jobs, and stuff like that is gatekept, and that's why it's so hard for people like us to go in. And then it's also quantity, quality, quantity over quality. I would, I, even if a thousand black bitches got jobs in white spaces today, if they are coons, they're not going to do nothing to help our community. You want, you want the people, the right people in the right spaces. Mm-hmm. So, so my thing is, so why address, so why address white privilege to the best of our ability when we can just create our own spaces? And like you said, you have all these black women that, you know, in different aspects of of jobs and everything else that's progress is going up. Uh, like if, if, as a, if we have the collect, collective mindset to create our own space create and, and push regardless of of uh, white supremacy. I mean, because it's always been there. And, it, and when you look out through time of history, like white supremacy, white supremacy has always been there. But. There still have been collective groups of black people that have pushed forward. You look at the Black Wall Street, um, like during the uh, 1920s and 30s. You look at just different. The black colleges and institutions built. Yeah. You yep. just look at those different aspects. You know why? And you look at, you know, black people can achieve a lot. So how do we fight the indivisibility of white privilege in institutions that cannot be replicated within our countries or little nation states like how do we combat invisibility of white privilege in in prison systems 
or in the court system, justice system overall? How do we do that? Uh, when it comes to like our, our systems, such as like you were saying, the court systems and everything, it kind of has to be a, a legal battle, uh, a battle uh, on as it relates to adv- adv- advocacy. Uh, you have to have people that are fighting for the issue on on various fronts. Uh, uh, I work like in, I work in the, like the social justice space, so I'm, I'm looking at it from that kind of from kind of that perspective where you have uh, lawyers that might come in on the legal battle. You have uh, organizers that 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 are connecting with that, with the communities and letting and letting them know about what's going on and uh, just kind of having, like I said, a battle on various fronts um, with people that can, can that can impact it in, in different ways. Um, when you look at uh, how uh, during the civil rights movement, during the civil rights movement, how they were able to kind of, you know, attack the civil, civil rights and uh, just the white privilege in Jim Crow itself, uh, it was legal battle. It was uh, creating situations like Rosa Parks on the bus, or or getting black kids into into schools that created legal battles, uh, that created organizers to be on the front line uh, to talk to people and get people aware of the situation and create a a, a unit of, of people in the community that are that are that are like a collective unit that are working together. It's only the fourth day of Black History Month, y'all, and I'm already pissed. Let's talk about this article. This is from Bloomberg, y'all. It will take Black Americans 320 years to catch up to white neighbors. It will take more than three centuries for Black Americans to achieve the same quality of life as their white neighbors after the racial gap widened in more than half the country in the past decade. The 320 years is in rural counties like in Cato Parish, Louisiana, and in more urban areas like New York and San Francisco, it's around 160 years. Only 48% of U.S. counties reduced the racial gap in the past decade. No U.S. county with a significant Black population has achieved parity, and the 37 that are close to it house just 0.1% of the total U.S. Black population. The study assumes that results for white residents will remain at today's levels, but notes that those estimates are conservative because their conditions are likely to improve over time. So we're seeing the quality of life decreasing for Black people in this country and the quality of life improving for white people in this country. Noted. They analyzed 25 metrics related to the quality of life, including rates of poverty and food insecurity, job opportunities, life expectancy, and the incarceration rate across the U.S. from megacities to rural areas. And the report highlights that a number of solutions can be used to help bridge the gap, including affordable housing in mixed income areas, health insurance for U.S. residents without coverage, and the expansion of high quality early education programs. I'm upset for so many reasons. Obviously, the first is the fact that 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 gap even exists period but also like during our month of black history month how could you come so close but be so far in this article obviously the article is reporting on what's actually in that results from mckinsey and i'm gonna go and actually read that to try to see what they say but the fact that slavery Jim Crow, discrimination like how is that not mentioned in the article as the cause for this gap like, how can you talk about a symptom, but not talk about the cause of the symptom? And it's just so crazy to me because like, okay, we've made some progress in the sense that like, for many years, they would have never made an article like this. But now you know what the issue is, and you're not actually doing anything to solve the problem. And to me, that's worse than saying, we're just going to ignore it, period, because you know what's going on. But now what's the next step? Like, let's stop talking about it and let's start actually doing them actions and not just acknowledging the fact that we know that these things will improve people's lives, but actually doing the things to improve people's lives.
This is exactly why I started my page and I make videos like this because I'm ready to hold corporate America, the finance industry, and the business industry accountable, okay? Y'all say that you want diversity. You say that you want to see improvements. Okay, so let's do the work. And the issue is that a lot of times they're not willing to go as far as they need to go. They just want to do a little bit and not do the whole thing. So I'm here saying it's time to step up. And in every place that I'm in, I will be holding people accountable to actually do the steps that will lead to actual change and improvement. Shout out to the slaves. Yeah, shout out to the slaves. You feel me? Shout out to Harriet Tubman. That shout was out to the real nigga. Yeah, shout out to the Mississippi niggas. Yeah, yeah, shout, shout out, out to the Mississippi niggas. niggas. Yeah, big penitentiary tractor dra dragon ass niggas. <laughs> niggas. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Born and, they, and they don't talk loud. They whisper. Dangerous niggas whisper. And shout out again to all those people who hate my guts. Y'all are doing a justice and an effort to the world. Keep breaking these men down one at a time. Shout out LGBTQ. You are obsessed and sick. And we are back with the big black shout out, the blackest shout out in the world. For those who do not know, the big black shout out is an opportunity to help circulate the back dollar back into our communities and for audience members to explore black owned hidden gems. So, Karanja, who would you like to shout out today? Uh, I want to shout out um, three people. Um, first uh, is my brother, uh, Quan Home. Take off Quan on Instagram. Uh, he's a business within himself. Uh, if you need anybody to host any parties, events, weddings, whatever, uh, that's your guy. Also, my other brother. Uh, Hold on, what's his social media? Uh, it take off Quan. So shout out to Take Out Quan. Take off Quan. What spell it? Take off Quan. Like the nigga that died. Take off. Well, you don't gotta say it like that. That's the way I reference yeah. it. Yeah. Take off. Quan. Rest, rest his soul. All right. Take well, off one. Shout out to that young man. Uh, shout out to my other brother, uh, Big Show, Big Show Kennels. Uh, he sells dogs. Dogs. If you want a pit. Design a dog. Uh, I don't, XL. Bu uh, pit bullies. I don't know. Oh, that's so Blue nice. Type of dog, big dog. He yeah. give them shots and everything. And yeah, got they, they got. They got paper. What kind of dogs he got? Pit. Like Blue Nose. I guess Blue Nose, it, XL, XL, they call like it like HD XL. I don't know, like he be having them dogs like real buffed up and shit where they can't breathe and nah, run nah, and sit down. Nah, not like that. They regular dogs. Okay. They just taking taking care of. Oh, they they catch frisbees and play fish. That's they nice. They can. Yo, what's yeah. what's his social media? Uh, Big Show Kennel underscore HD. Big Big, Big Show Big Show Kennels underscore HD. HD in uh -huh. high definition. My yeah. God. And uh shout out to him. Shout out to all the niggas in HD and 4K and such. Yeah, and uh one more person, uh HR Clothier. Um uh, went to Jack State with him. Uh, nice clothing brand. I mess with it. What kind of clothes he got? They street fashion, streetwear. Yeah, streetwear. What he ain't got no tagline, he just be making t shirts. Nah, it, it's legit. What kind of shirts they is? I'm I'm just gonna show it. You gotta use your words, I'm gonna put you on a t shirt. Oh, yeah. Right here. Oh. I'm just, I just got to send it to you. HR is so dear. Yeah, these HR are uh, like clueless vibe. Real preppy, like embroidered yeah, jacket. Pre preppy streetwear. Yeah, I like that. That's nice. Yeah. Well, shout out to all of them. Um, Now, if you have a business or you know someone else who has a business and would like a shout out, make sure you're reaching out to me. That's afrocentric at gmail.com. Let me know. this episode with you today Karanja. this was a good discussion the, for real? yeah this was more like a debate okay. I like that you know I like going back and forth with people but only if they smart enough to handle it I consider you smart I don't know if you could really handle me in real life but no, thank you so. no okay. <laughs> thank you thank you so much for being here and talking about dismantling white supremacy with me this afternoon. I oh, want to Yeah. Oh, okay. We take down the system. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, the oppressor got his foot on my neck. And we gonna shake it off. So yeah, um, power to the people and to nobody else. Uh -huh. Yeah. No yeah, no justice, no peace. Hey, I'm black and I'm proud. Get down, get up on your good foot. Whatever you need to do, you know. So, is there anything you'd like to say to the black community before I let you go? Um, what's one thing I want to say to the black community? Um, 
just keep growing, develop, um, whatever you're good at, stick to it, and just, just keep, just keep uh, growing and getting better. That is so wow. That was powerful. That really touched me in my heart chakra. I'm glad it did. Yes, thank you. And I want to thank my listeners. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And thank you so much for choosing to be Afrocentric today. Please remember that Black Lives Matter. Make sure to listen and to... All Black Lives Matter. What you said? I said all Black Lives Matter. (laughs) That was... Listen. Two separate things. Uh-huh. Don't help me. Don't save me. I don't want to be safe. Make sure to listen and protect black women. And the only thing that you must do in this lifetime is be black and die. And remember that we are just civilized people having civilized conversations. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye. I've never once encountered that yet. I'm sure the I'm sure the boogeyman white supremacist exists somewhere in America. I've just never met him. <laughs> never seen one. Never met one in my life, right? Maybe I'll meet a uh, maybe I'll meet a unicorn sooner. And and maybe those exist too.